Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, John, Howard, Tony. Every time these, these leaders speak, I learn something. And uh, just channeling John, I mean, what you heard was, these things take time to set up, but right now, when you, when you think about joining uh, uh, SESME, it is a consortium with literally hundreds of members, right? And uh, Howard really hit the nail on the head. We have, we're enormously diverse in this country. Over quarter million manufacturers, more than 98% of them are small manufacturers. And this is, you know, we've talked about the projects. The projects are important, but the other thing that doesn't come across is that when you join an institute, especially if you're a small manufacturer, a technology provider, you are making connections with your customer or your customer's customer. So we actually did an independent study a few years ago and we found out not only were they involved with the projects inside the institute, but the companies were doing more outside the institute based on the connections that they made. So that, that really speaks to the value of connecting and collaborating. So I'm really pleased now to uh, bring our second panel, which is the voice of industry. And let me flip this over to the slide. Uh, this will be moderated by uh, Don Ufford. Uh, Don is, Don just joined us. Uh, he is the Assistant Director for Supply Chain and Ecosystem Development. But uh, like myself, Don is a guy from industry. Over 30 years with uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, developing uh, cars, trucks, vans, worldwide. So Don, take it away with the industry panel. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. And uh, if our panel would come up, I'd like to take an opportunity to uh, introduce the industry leaders we have here today. Um, first of all, on my far right is uh, Mike Shimazu. Uh, Mike brings decades of experience and thought leadership as Raytheon or RTX's Smart Factory Technical Director in the Industry 4.0 Operating System Organization. Before his current corporate role, Mike served as the Factory Integration and Modernization Lead within Digital Technology and Operations Innovation and Modernization. Using, he helped usher in Raytheon's digital transformation. He's also held numerous other engineering and operations roles across several companies and has spent the last 18 years in aerospace and defense. Next to Mike is Brian. Um, Brian Pearlston is the Digital Manufacturing Innovation Leader at Owens Corning. They're a world leader in insulation, roofing, and fiberglass composites. He's a member of Owens Corning's Manufacturing Digital Transformation Organization focused on identifying and deploying solutions that help drive operational transformation in the manufacturing environment. With Owens Corning since 2018, Brian has worked to advance its digital transformation, leading programs such as the Early Warning Diagnostics Process Health Program and Strategic Initiative to safe, safely empower its workforce with information, knowledge, and expertise by making digital information more accessible through a variety of technologies and approaches. And finally, next to me here is Paul Perkins. Paul is the president and co-founder of Amatrol, an Indiana-based manufacturer of technical learning systems and online interactive multimedia software, which prepares individuals for occupation in Industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing, energy, and logistics. Paul is the author of over, of over 20 texts on industrial automation and is the current chairman of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, a member of Indiana Governor's Workforce Cabinet, and a member of Indiana Manufacturers Association Board of Directors, not to mention the past chair of the National Governors Association State Workforce Board Chairs Association. With that, uh, we'll get right into it, and uh, I'll ask uh, Mike, Brian, and Paul, uh, Mike first, um, question about What's the benefit of belonging to a Manufacturing USA Institute? We just heard from the Institute directors a lot of the great things they're doing. What's your perspective on what the benefits are? So I believe that the benefits are pretty significant, uh, so much so that we've been partners with these Manufacturing Innovation Institutes since the inception, and we're actually uh, partners with, I believe, six of the Innovation Institutes, so says me clearly, um, 
MXD, formerly we knew it as DMDII, AIM, ARM, NextFlex, and America Makes. And when we think about the value that they bring, it's kind of in four threads. One is, um, as an industry partner, we get to influence those roadmaps and the topics that are being presented. So they are you know, complex problems that we need to solve, but not just us, we also need the industrial base to solve. Um, secondly to that would be, it provides a, networks to a, a network to establish partnerships with university, small to medium sized manufacturers, and vendors who have similar interests and complementary capabilities. It gives us visibility that we wouldn't particularly see. We are such a massive uh, organization. Sometimes those, you know, 98%, I believe, said that, you know, we're small to medium size. Um, we don't always have visibility of those ones. We typically work with bigger ones. Um, thirdly, it's um, leveraging funding through cost shares. So, you know, I guess kind of how we like to put it is sometimes we have first class expectations, but we have Greyhound budgets. And so that's kind of what we've seen with, you know, especially how we can take and use our OPEX and CAPEX most effectively. And that really helps those SMMs. And then finally, it's visibility to our government customers, right? By using this public-private partnership, we are showing that we're investing in next-gen capabilities, and we're using that and increasing the overall uh, capabilities of our industry and our manufacturing base. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Brian, uh, you and Owens Corning, um, very different. You're not in defense. You're on uh, the commercial and residential side of things. What does uh, Owens Corning see as the benefit of belonging to a manufacturer? Manufacturing USA Institute. Sure, great question. Thanks for uh, asking. And uh, I'll be, you know, to be honest, you know, we're we just recently joined uh, with Sesme, uh, but I have some experience with the MXD through other uh, through, through earlier careers. And you know, when I think about what do we see as the benefits, one of them is the external perspective. So what is what are other people doing? What are they seeing? How are we bringing this all together? as other, you know, from other companies. Because we, a lot of times, you know, we get kind of biased in how we think, and we tend to uh, put those blinders on and continue to go down a path. So bringing together other organizations, other thoughts, um, have, have been really, really helpful to us. Uh, and, and then, you know, the other thing I, I think about this it, that's really important, probably the most important thing I can think of is these, these organizations are thinking about the future of work, our next generation workforce. And there is nothing more critical to manufacturing than getting, and make, getting people interested in working in manufacturing right now. So those are the two things I would highlight today. Well, and so uh, following up on that uh, workforce, I think uh, Paul, Amatrol, really big into workforce training and development. Um, can you tell us what, what's the benefit of belonging to an institute? How'd you get started with it? Absolutely, uh, Don, thank you. Well, Amatrol develops training tools that training providers use to deliver skills to a variety of industries. As Don mentioned, we're involved in advanced manufacturing and energy and logistics. And one of the most important things for us is to be on the cutting edge of developing new products, new skills that are needed by today's manufacturers. And the, one of the benefits of working with the institutes is that they have an ecosystem of industry and government that are all thinking about a particular theme, uh, whether it's digital manufacturing or cybersecurity or uh, clean manufacturing. But uh, it's an opportunity for us to connect with the leaders in the industry to develop a, a, a group of people that want to work on a new project uh, together. And, and, uh, and, and solving the workforce challenge is something that is a huge, huge uh, effort and it just can't be done by one company and so the opportunity to have collaborations with others to solve that as well as to develop a new products are the reasons why we participate. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've heard that uh, from a few folks already and I'm glad, uh, glad we're delivering on that. If I might uh, build a little bit on uh, the technical side a little bit more, Mike, um, can you talk to me about uh, What's your perspective on unique facilities and or capabilities that Manufacturing USA Institutes bring? We heard a bit about being able to work together. Um, can you help us out as far as what have you experienced? Yeah, so being in aerospace and defense, 
we are extremely limited in the kinds of technologies we can bring on board. So, you know, we've got um, stringent cybersecurity requirements, we've got stringent data sovereignty requirements, but a lot of these small and medium-sized, you know, vendors or smaller um, uh, folks, they can't really conform to that. So instead, what we have to do is we have to create simulated environments. So I have to take my factory, make a fake factory, keep it firewalled from my networks, and have it, you know, really emulate what we're trying to do out there, that is a significant cost to us. And we've got 250 factories all across the world. I build things from atoms to arrays. I'm you know, worried about you know, quantum mechanics in one part of my business, and I'm shipping 80-ton radars out of the other side of my factory. So what is interesting about this perspective is we can sort of try before we buy, and we can help influence that technology in your environments. So you know, for instance, we just brought in a uh, you know, we had a vendor who could only, was only on the public cloud. I can't connect them in my factories, I can't put them on any of my hardware, and also that they generate technical data. So it took me, you know, it would take me six to nine months to get even just a small pilot in my production facilities. I can turn on SESME or any one of those in innovation institutes on the drop of a hat. So that's where I think the value comes from. The level of insight and the level of cooperation and partnership with those vendors, plus we can then teach them using our expertise and experience, here's what you need to do to get to the level that we can adopt that and scale it across all, you know, 180,000 employees, 250 plus factories. Brian, have you had uh, similar experience that uh, you can share a little bit about being able to use some of those unique capabilities that uh, the manufacturing USA Institutes have that you've been able to apply? So it's not necessarily that we've been able to apply them directly in our organization, but we're seeing through vendors and some of the work that vendors are doing and getting that experience in manufacturing and the requirements around actually implementing, impl uh, implementing their product in manufacturing. You know, there's a lot of people who don't have that manufacturing experience. So getting to go over to work with people like in, uh, the team at SESME or at MXD or some of these other institutes, they can see how unique, what, what is unique about manufacturing, what are the things they need to do to integrate appropriately and help to bring their solution at scale uh, successfully in, in our manufacturing facilities. Yeah, and uh, as I think about uh, some of the facilities and capabilities that institutes have, um, I've seen at some of the institutes, Paul, uh, Amatrol has put a lot of effort into uh, developing interactive hardware solutions and other solutions that uh, I've seen at some institutes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why, why do you do that, and why mm -hmm. are institutes a, a good place to partner to do that? Well, the institutes all have a, a, their own theme, and, and we work in so many different parts of, of uh, technology world that, uh, that each of those themes has relevance to the things that we're doing, and so that's why we've sought out multiple institutes to partner with. And, uh, but they, you know, the, the uh, resources that they have there, the talent that they have there, I'm just so impressed with the people that I see. SESME is a great example. Their project managers are uh, not just engineers, but engineers with 20 years of experience working in relevant industry. And, and so we found that there's just been a, a, a great uh, partner in having advisors that can help uh, give us guidance as well as connect us with their industry uh, partners and it's enabled us to develop some really innovative tools. The IIoT workstation uh, training kit that we developed with SESME. Uh, SESME actually had the vision for that and, and, uh, and sought us out and, and, uh, and I'm so glad that they, they did. I think we, that we're really making an impact with it but, uh, but they, you know, they're not just helping facilitate uh, conversations, they're, they're actively participating in leading them themselves. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's super important, trying to make sure that it's relevant and you're harnessing the capability of the industrial partners to identify where we need to go. I think we heard from the last panel, looking into the future, where's the technology going, where's workforce going, how do we make sure we get that feedback back then to uh, groups like yours in order to make sure we're preparing that workforce? Mm -hmm. um, some of it's so far out in the future, though, that um, there's a lot of intellectual property around it. And um, maybe, Mike, could you share with me a little bit, and, uh, and Brian next, uh, a little bit about 
um, how did the institutes handle intellectual property, and and is it a problem? Are you, uh, you know, is that something where you're, you know, don't worry about it? So I will say something that I learned early on in my career, and it was uh, the first rule about Raytheon is you do not talk about Raytheon. So being on the defense side, right, IP is of extreme importance to us. And so a lot of times what we've done is we've, we take a look, it's almost like a make-buy decision, like what IP is critical for us, for our programs, for national defense, for the defense of our allies, and then what is that IP that we feel would best benefit the industrial base. And so some of that we clearly we do on IRAD, but there is very thoughtful conversations on IP and the protection of it or the release of that. So, And do the institutes have a mechanism set up so that they recognize and they're able to work with you and help figure that out? Because there's a lot of partners we just heard, you know, a lot of industrial partners and other partners. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, there is a mechanism to be able to do that. Um, I'm not as uh, familiar with the latest intricacies of it, but I know like depending on your level, um, you can either have like first dibs or that you can co-own that IP with other um, uh, partners in that space. So I think it's also though it's very important when you are um, determining that team chemistry and makeup, when you're looking at like antitrust and competitiveness, um, so legal uh, from that standpoint, right, has been very active in this space given the current legislation around it. So I think we'll see some changes, but what I'm hoping though is that it's for the better. Yeah. Right. Brian, your thoughts, comments? Sure. You know, as I think about intellectual property, I brought this up today. As we go and, and want to invest in any of these solutions that these organizations have put out, we're gonna go and do our due diligence. We're gonna make sure, especially anything that's going out into the cloud is secure, that it's audited, um, that our information that we would put into that system is protected. There's nothing more important to our company than our intellectual property. Um, so we really, we really think uh, really hardly about that information. But at, with that said, you know, there are technology capabilities that things that we will learn or whatnot that aren't necessarily gonna have to be our intellectual property. There are things that can be shared to help the industry as a whole. So we have to make that, take a look at that information make a, and make sure we have a good balance of that and not be, you know, a lot of times people wanna go to too far to one way and tend, tends to be more protective. I've been battling that over the last five and a half years at Owens Corning of certain things of being very protective and it's really, you know, brought challenges to our ability to drive forward with what we need to do to transform our organization. And, and, and by helping think through that and using these organizations to even help think through that, it's gonna help accelerate what we need to do. Yeah, I think that's one of the benefits as we take a look at the broad Manufacturing USA network and the institutes. Um, they're recognizing because it's a public-private partnership and because there's such strong industry involvement, um, there's a need uh, to make sure we protect and, and we enable the pre-competitive space that you're talking about. But then at the same time, when it comes time to transition that uh, technology, how do we do it properly, respecting what those industrial needs are? And, uh, and you know, also, how do we make sure we enable people to uh, learn about the workforce to learn about it and the supply base to learn about that? Can you tell us uh, a little bit, Paul, as we... Uh, as we talk about this, it, um, it occurs to me there's probably training opportunities and then there are probably opportunities for other ways to interact um, in learning about uh, what the needs are and some of the institutes have put programs out there, mm -hmm. probably not only for, um, uh, for those in the workforce, but those preparing right. to come in the workforce. Right. How, how has that been matured over the time you've been involved? Well, one of the things that has been, a, I think, a real strength of the Manufacturing USA Institutes is that there was an education workforce director, I believe, uh, cre position created in every one of them, or if there wasn't a specific position, there was somebody that had a strong focus on it. And so that effort has been going on for quite a long time because 
uh, the, the, uh, the uh, folks that put the institutes together recognize that we don't have enough people going into these careers. And, and if we're going to solve the, the technical challenge, we really have to solve the people challenge at the same time. And, and so there's been a lot of thought that's been given to that. And a number of the institutes have, have really put uh, their, their heart into that as well as all the technology work that they've been doing. So it's really been two parallel uh, tracks. And, and uh, one example of uh, some work that's been done at, uh, at LIFT, the Detroit uh, uh, Institute that's focused on materials. They're very involved in, in, uh, in, in uh, all aspects of advanced manufacturing. And, and the Department of Defense gave them a grant to develop a manufacturing engineering program for high schools. And they call it IGNITE. And that program's now being disseminated uh, throughout the United States. And, uh, and uh, programs at SESME, uh, uh, not only the IIoT kit that I talked about a moment ago, but also uh, they have funded a number of education initiatives to develop curriculum on smart manufacturing with the idea that it can go into colleges, industry, and, and even high schools. And what we're looking to do is, to, is opportunities where uh, we can apply some of that learning in one institute into another, and I, and I think that uh, there's really been some very uh, sh uh, strong receptiveness of uh, having uh, those types of, of collaborations, and we see ourselves as a facilitator to help, uh, to actually help implement that. Yeah, and Mike, at RTX, um, what's your experience been, and what's your interest in uh, workforce development as it applies to the institutes? Yeah, so I don't know about what other folks are experiencing, but I'm assuming it's the same We've got a significant attrition, either you know due to retirement, and so if we look at that bow wave, right? We knew this was coming, you know, years ago. That based upon where we are in um, in terms of our hiring practices, we've got a very a maturing workforce, and then we've got a, a number of new hires that are coming in that are being put in positions maybe they aren't ready for, but they're going to be ready for. And then how do we backfill those? And then, like, so we're looking at our own internal curriculums, but how best can we match that with academia, with universities? And at some points, though, we, we even feel that if you're catching them at university, you're already too late. So can we start to push that even further forward in and so like you know when we go and work with like stem first robotics right that's where we can get them engaged within uh, manufacturing to make manufacturing sexy again i guess <laughs> yeah, brian your thought i know uh, you shared with me a little bit some of the challenges on uh, workforce and i mean this is this is the biggest opportunity we have and i think the biggest opportunity that these uh, institutes all have is to think about the people side of this it's people, process, apply technology. And, you know, I was talking with Jeff Winter a little while ago, and, you know, I don't want to talk about proof of concept. I want to talk about proof of value. What is okay. the value that it's going to apply, these capabilities are going to apply in the flow of work? Does it add value in the flow of work to these people? Because if it doesn't, they're not going to adopt it. And I like what you said about getting there earlier in the, in the education. We have to start... Honestly, we have to start down at the elementary schools and get kids interested in manufacturing, in engineering. Let them know that there are tracks they can go. You don't necessarily have to go to, to college. You can go into trades. But you, we, we need them to understand what, what it's all about, that it's sexy. I'm a child of the 70s. My dad back then, he did everything he could think of not to get my brother and I to go into manufacturing. He, you know, he was like, it's, it's dirty, it's, you know, dangerous, it's dull, right? You know, all the three Ds that we all panic about. But today, it's not all those things. It, it, there's, there's some sexiness to manufacturing, and we have to let people know that. And I think these institutes really have that great opportunity to show these, you know, think about all these new technologies and how we're bringing it in. And we have to bring those technologies and make sure they're available in the workforce, because, you know, this next generation uh, of, of, of workers are expecting that they're not going to have paper and, and clipboards. They're going to have the iPads, the, you know, the, the, the Android devices, whatever, you know, technology. They're going to have it. They're going to have AR, VR. They, that's what they live with today. That's how they get, you know, how they learn today. And we have to adjust to that. So I think the institutes are really thinking about that and, you know, thinking about the people side and right. the process side right. and then how to apply the right technology to it. Well, and... Speaking of people and, and introducing people to manufacturing, I think the 
Um, the institutes have made a lot of effort and have a lot of great uh, partners, uh, such as we see up here today, that are established companies, well known for manufacturing, and, uh, and are strong partners. But the institutes have also reached out a lot to startups. And, you know, when you start talking about some of these cool new technologies and, and, uh, and people that have developed those, but maybe they need a bit more help as far as bringing it online and manufacturing to be able to make that. Uh, the institutes are really an on-ramp for them to uh, do that. And I think I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. And to close out our session, what we're going to do is we're going to see a brief video about some of the startups that have been involved with some of our institutes, uh, what the institutes were able to bring to, uh, to these startups, and how they were able to benefit from that. So thank you very much. Let's stay here as we watch the video. We are in America. We are the country who went to the moon. That inspired the whole generation. And innovation doesn't stop there. We created the computer, the internet. All these are American innovations. The United States has an incredible job in fundamental research. Where we, and every other country, struggles is that commercialization process. It's very difficult to make that transition from initial lab scale to commercial scale for that product. And what we're doing is helping our private sector move across that valley of death. Manufacturing USA Institute, they encourage team building to begin with. And therefore, all these partnerships inherently create technologies which are immediately usable. We knew we were going to develop a technology that could have a huge impact on the pharmaceutical world. That's not something a little company can do. So our goal all along was find a great partner who could really take our vision forward. Without Nimble, I don't think we would have been successful developing our technology. We found that actually working with startups has provided us an opportunity to look at a lot of new product development initiatives. Now, it's not an either and an or, right? Because if you're working with a startup and developing a new capability, of course, the larger companies are also looking at that, and they get to know about it through our member events, through our webinars and other exposures. So it's still one community. It requires a lot of upfront money to buy equipment and hire a team that can produce 100,000 parts. This is where the government agencies and institutes like IACME comes in to help those small businesses bridge the gap. What AIM has done is just enable us to skip multiple steps along the way, and it's amazing that there are these places set up that are specifically created for innovation and for letting startups access the best tools during development. We made these small prototypes right here at AFOA. A lot of the U.S. companies don't have the technology to make fabrics out of tiny fibers, and they don't want to work on small prototypes. So they've helped us in the product development process. When Doris Taylor was working to create Pediatric Heart's Army and Biofab were able to wrap around her and provide her with introductions and assistance from many of our other members. Unless you can make all the different stakeholders comfortable to work with each other and share, we're not going to get anywhere. Let's bring people that really understand the world of manufacturing and put them directly in contact with the people that have the science. And Arm Institute has been tremendous because we got the opportunity to interact and mix with the ecosystem of robot OEMs, sensor OEMs, and other partners, and together create a solution that can actually be used in the real world. I had a startup, and my company is folded in as now part of Think IQ. We would have not survived at all, potentially, had we not met Think IQ through our work with Sesame. One thing that kind of unites us all is this hunger for innovation and a sense of patriotism that we can, as a country, produce amazing things. We're talking about national security, we're talking about public health, we're talking about economic growth. We see all of those things as a result of this investment. That is the role the Institutes play. You cannot get more important. The United States is the land of innovation. We just need to take it to that next step and look forward to inventing it, developing it, and manufacturing it here in the United States.